Novavax is the new vaccine just about to hit stage three. Um, it's a different type of vaccine. It's a protein-based subunit with an adjuvant which causes an immune response. We all know about BioNTech being the mRNA computer enhanced vaccine. Today I'll be focusing a little bit on the differences of the two vaccines, starting with the, the team and then going on to its immunogenicity. Novavax is led by a veteran CEO. His name is Stanley Oak. Um, in a prior career, he was the head of global regulatory affairs for the company Baxter uh, for vaccines. Um, in September 2019, he was able to capitalize on a share increase and make $4.5 million by selling Novavax stock. Um, one concerning issue that in Glassdoor.com in 2019, one of the managers reviewed the company as such that it has good ideas, bad management, the company will probably die soon. I mean, that to me is a bit concerning. The other thing that concerns me is their inability to um, manufacture on scale. Uh, vaccines of this nature of COVID-19, once it's successful, needs to be scaled up really, really fast. And I think they'll lag behind in being able to supply um, their vaccine if it is a successful candidate. Now I'll go on to compare the team that's behind BioNTech. BioNTech has a team of scientific rock stars, I would say. I'd like to begin with the person which I believe is critical to their vaccine team, but it's just been ignored by the news and the media. Um, her name is Catalina Corioco. I believe she deserves the motor. Nobel Prize for her pioneering work in RNA mediated immune activation. If it wasn't for her and her work, uh, I don't believe the companies BioNTech and Moderna would even exist. She um, pioneered the work about lipid technologies and being able to activate um, mRNA in cell nucleuses. She was uh, the person who basically laid the foundation for these future vaccines to occur. Without her hard work in 1995, in 2021, we would not have a vaccine that was RNA-based, which at the moment looks like the most effective vaccines that have ever been created. Now, along with her, her bosses, Ugo Sahane and Aslam Turki, they're rock stars as well. They created a company called Ganymed in 2001, and their first drug they created was an absolute blockbuster it was called Extandy for prostate cancer. They went to sell that uh, drug to um, Astellas Pharma and they netted a nice $4.1 billion. Like a normal person would take that $4.1 billion and say, look, I've done my uh, bit for science and for humanity and probably just relax and take it easy. No, but not this, these two. What they decided to do is let's use this money to create cures for cancer. I mean, and also cures for things that were extremely difficult to treat like HIV and the herpes uh, virus and in fact they've actually gone very far with this with the University of Pennsylvania they have really um, successfully demonstrated that their vaccine is quite effective and in animal models have got a 98 percent effect uh, effectiveness for uh, for general herpes now also with that they've got a melanoma vaccine which is stage three and they have now um, also are their front runners with their with their uh, Pfizer vaccine or BioNTech vaccine um, because of this, this the size of the company they've had to shoulder get some help through uh, BioNTech uh, through Pfizer and also for another company called Fuzon which is a Chinese um, multinational company that uh, delivers drugs and other pharmaceutical goods. Novavax is grown as a spike protein in moth cells. Um, it uses the spike DNA to mass produce this protein. This protein is then packaged up uh, and then injected, and then it will 
basically create antibodies uh, for the coronavirus. Uh, one issue that I can clearly see about this is that it seems to be based purely on the original Wuhan spike protein. Um, and because the Wuhan virus is rapidly mutating, um, I think even before it goes to launch, it might find an issue with the um, South African strain. And I think it would be a matter of urgency now for them to test it against the South African strain. I think failure to do so and prove that um, in the uh, vaccine submission will create serious questions, especially if uh, by the time they do launch BioNTech or another company were to show that their vaccine was uh, actually effective against mutant strains. Now, BioNTech follows a similar path um, on their development. They basically got the DNA sequence on a computer model uh, and they created the mRNA from the Wuhan strain using the spike protein. But they took it one step further. They were not happy just to get a mRNA that was active against the Wuhan strain. They modeled it against 19 other pseudoviruses. So they not only made sure that it would be effective for the Wuhan strain, they would made, went on to make sure it was effective in mutated strains. So they chose 19 different uh, types of pseudoviruses. And they also had 20 vaccine candidates before they found the one. This is really, really smart. So not only did they um, look at the original strain, they went and did 20 pseudoviruses. They actually trialed 20 different vaccines until they narrowed it down to the one that they're currently using, which is really forward thinking, I believe. There's not much in the way of quantifiable data about its immune response. However, it is published that it has a CD4 count um, and it does show interleukin uh, responses and forms TH1 uh, responses, which is really promising. It also shows some neutralizing antibodies, which is also promising. Really can't say much about it yet because human uh, trials haven't been conducted or recorded or published as yet. Once that becomes available, we can then comment on that. Now, the difference in the immune response um, of the BioNTech vaccine is that it stimulates CD4, CD8, TH1 cells and inevitably I would believe would have a very big cascade effect on memory B cells. Now memory B cells are important to create a long lasting immunity. We see these in vaccines like polio, which give you two, three years and even lifetime immunities. This is really, really good. Now they've took it to another level uh, to make sure that their vaccine would um, last very, very long. They basically created 19 pseudoviruses uh, and they used the mRNA which would combat them and integrated that into their vaccine to give it that long lasting effect. Um, so not only does it have this cascade reaction uh, with long lasting immunity through CD8 and CD4 counts, um, it also uh, is future proof by the fact that it's been modeled against a total of 20 viruses, the Wuhan and 19 pseudoviruses. So it should give us a long lasting effect. Novavax hasn't uh, come up with a successful vaccine as yet. Um, however, they came pretty close in 2016 and 2019. They had their RSV vaccine on both occasions goes to stage three, only to spectacularly fail um, in clinical trials. So the issue for them was that in April 2019, they almost got delisted by the American Stock Exchange. Uh, then a lifeline was thrown to them by the United States government um, in 2019 when the Wuhan virus was detected. Um, their protein candidate was then produced. They've got some good uh, results through uh, uh, clinical studies on animals. It then is moving on through the various stages. However, I don't believe they're going to succeed with the South African strain, and that could be a real problem for them if BioNTech or another company succeeds while they're still going through phase three trials. So with the Pfizer efficacy, uh, it's equally good 
if not better. And when I say why it's better, it's simply because they've looked at younger age groups. And in the younger age group between 16 and 17, it's 100% effective. However, I would say the sample size is quite small. Um, I would have hoped for a bigger sample size, but I guess it's very difficult to recruit young people in, in a vaccine study. Um, 18 to 64, we get 94.6. Uh, 65 to 74, 92.9. And greater than 70, uh, 75, 100% efficacy. Um, I guess, you know, that's pretty, that's a really good result. Um, and in comparison to um, Moderna, it's much of a muchness, really, I would say. The FDA results of BioNTech is what I would expect in every FDA results. Um, what it does go in, into is the quantifiable uh, CD4 and CD8 count. Uh, it's very, very high. Um, it also talks about interleukin, inter, interleukin 4. But um, And if we are going to see a Novavax comparative, I would love to see this on an FDA submission or EU submission. I've looked through current submissions and, and we don't seem to see this in clarity uh, for Moderna or even Oxford. So hopefully the Novavax team can do something similar to BioNTech when it comes to this stage. I think it uh, creates a lot of confidence in a vaccine when this is published. At the moment, the world is fearing South Africa and the strain that's coming from there. Basically, South Africa is crying for vaccines because they've not been given much love by the vaccine companies because they're not one of the richest countries in the world. And in fact, Moderna um, and Oxford have refused to actually supply Africa with vaccines. And I believe it's out of fear, not because they um, uh, don't want to be uh, kind to Africa, but I think they fear that if they did give their vaccine, it would fail in Africa because they never designed it for mutations. But BioNTech and Pfizer have taken that step to actually provide um, African healthcare workers vaccines. And they do plan to roll up the vaccine at a discounted price to Africa. The brave move, I believe, is the confidence they have in their vaccine because they have future proofed it. Currently, the Pfizer vaccine is the only vaccine that has been proposed to be used in um, the African region. And in fact, the company has uh, pledged to give about 15 million, 50 million vaccines, make it available for um, the African nations. Um, uh, Moderna and Oxford has declined to actually make the same offer. I believe this might be due to fear uh, that their vaccines will be exposed as failures um, in regards to the mutation. I think it's very brave of BioNTech to do what they're doing and it's also a, a great humanitarian um, gesture for them to do such a thing. We're hoping that Novavax could equal that result but I feel it'd be very difficult with the platform they're doing. It seems like a very long and convoluted process because it's um, not a direct process like what we can see is happening um, with the BioNTech. And that's why I guess the delay has been so long for them actually just to get from stage one to stage three. Um, the other thing is perhaps that's holding them back is they seem to be going, a lot, going it alone. Um, whereas we see that um, BioNTech has had a lot of help from Pfizer to launch their vaccine in terms of manufacturing, but they, Novavax will also require a lot of help to get their vaccine out there, to get it to scaled up. There is one huge advantage though with Novavax, which I should have mentioned earlier. It doesn't require that negative 70 degrees um, storage. It will be stable at two to eight degrees, and that's because it's a protein rather than mRNA. Proteins are much more stable than mRNA. I'd also guess that even if it wasn't stored correctly, you might find that the protein vaccine would be stable for uh, quite a while after uh, it's taken out of the fridge, but I'm sure they'll find that later on. Um, it's not something that concerns them right now. But So the thing that I believe that makes the BioNTech the ultimate winner in this uh, ra uh, you know, race between the two vaccines is that the fact that they have created pseudovirus uh, neutralizing neutralizing titers, um, which means they basically, they've kind of proven that their vaccine works against mutations. Now, this is really important. We're now realizing this 
Wuhan COVID-19 rapidly is mutating. And we've got like two or three really um, scary um, mutations around. We have the mink mutation, we have the UK mutation, and we have the South African mutation, which is really, really rapidly spreading now. Now, I think this has created a lot of fear for um, companies like Moderna and Oxford below. I don't see the same fear with BioNTech. In fact, Urus Sahain said, you know, he does believe it's going to work, but within two weeks, he'll be able to definitively say yes. And for some reason, it's not as efficacious as he wanted it to be. It would take him six weeks to modify this vaccine, which I truly believe is the case. And I don't think that well, there'll, be, there'll be so much of a requirement of modification because of the high initial efficacy rate. Um, I think Moderna more so will have an issue because if you look at the two different vaccine platforms, um, they actually use three times the concentration in the Moderna vaccine to elicit the immune response. And that means a lot, actually, because you're saying that um, you don't need that much for BioNTech because it's more uh, directed. Uh, so it's not concentration driven. It's more that it creates uh, multiple attachment points to the spike protein. Um, and I think that does give it a bit of an edge against all its competitors. Um, and they do have a head start because they have been, you know, researching cancer um, vaccine for years and years. And we know cancers mutate a lot uh, and they've used this knowledge about mutation to devise a COVID vaccine, which has given them an edge over Moderna and every other vaccine that will come forth from here, here on in.